Alrighty, well welcome to Kaufman Museum. My name is Andy Schmidt Andrus and I am the director here at Kaufman Museum. Uh, first off, congratulations on your ability to maneuver the online reservation system and to get a seat. You are the special few in this world of COVID and social distancing to be in on this program live. Now, if you are uh, feeling guilty, uh, don't worry, uh, because those who you've deprived of a seat uh, can watch next week. So this program will be on the museum's YouTube channel next week, so that you can either watch again, those that did not have reservations can uh, watch for the first time. I have a few announcements and instructions before we get started. Uh, thank you all for wearing masks while you are inside, and we would ask that you do keep it above your nose. If you can also maintain social distancing, we would appreciate that very much. If you came with someone, you can scooch close together if that feels cozy and good, if it's someone that you usually spend time with. Um, let's see. Uh, I will announce a couple events that are coming up here at Kaufman Museum. On October 23, we will host our 20, uh, on October 23, the annual Living Endowment Dinner. And this year, the meal will be catered by Eldersley Farm. And you'll either pick it up here at the museum or we will take it to your home. So there will not be an event on site, but it'll be a pickup meal. And there are forms at the front desk. For those who are on our mailing list, you'll be getting that probably Monday. So we mailed it a couple days ago, and I would suspect it will be in your home mailboxes on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, the dinner will be the first event associated with an upcoming spring exhibit. And that exhibit celebrates 125 years of having a museum on the Bethel College campus. And that means that the first museum, a room in the Ab building, if you can imagine that, with Native American items and relics, um, that was in 1896. And the meal for Living Endowment Dinner will reflect that time period. In conjunction with the exhibit, we are also soliciting People's Choice nominations for items to be in that exhibit. The exhibit is a collection of items chosen by former staff, current staff, uh, former curators of exhibits. And if you remember something fondly or in horror, like I remember the gi gigantic snake, um, if you remember something that you'd like to have on exhibit, uh, you can fill out one of the forms. It's up at the front desk. It says People's Choice there on the vegetable table. Let us know what you think is worthy of display, and we will go through those and see what can fit into the exhibit. Now, on to our program for the day. I first met uh, Lauren Friesen last year during covid and that was in the summer of 2020. He made a trek from Chicago down to North Newton uh, to bring a family artifact that he had, had a, he had made arrangements to donate to the museum. So we're grateful for that, Lauren. And uh, that's really was our first meeting. And so my knowledge about Lauren is somewhat scant. I know he uh, cares deeply about Mennonite history and that he is a loyal patron of Kaufman Museum. Beyond that, I've had to learn more from the internet. And I know he attended Bethel College and University of California at Berkeley. He is Professor Emeritus at the University of Michigan. He lives in Chicago, Illinois, and he grew up in Henderson. Lauren's pre presentation today is titled The Dutch Golden Age, Mennonite at the Core. Please help me welcome Lauren Friesen. I want to thank everyone for coming and also uh, thank the museum for inviting me to give the presentation and a special thank you to uh, Keith Sprunger, my history professor when I was a major at Bethel College. He uh, encouraged me to make this uh, journey and I want to thank him for that. But any errors that I make should not be attributed to him. <laughs> That's for certain. 
One other explanation I should make is that I don't speak Dutch very well, and so if I mispronounce words, and if you're a specialist in that field, your ears might hurt a bit now and then, but I'll do the best I can. I began this research project after I retired. I'd been doing theater, directing, um, teaching theater for 30-some years, and I wanted my evenings and weekends back, because if you know what theater is, it's rehearsal every night and performance somewhere every weekend. So I focused on this, thinking, well, that could be interesting, and now, seven years later, I'm still obsessed by it, you might say, and I keep making changes to my presentation as we go. So the Dutch Golden Age, I say Mennonite at the core, and I leave it up to you to decide later whether I have made that thesis believable. And it's up to you to figure that out. Uh, but I think I have, which is why I gave that title. There are three historic golden ages for the arts. One is Greece, one is Rome, and the other one is the Dutch Golden Age, which began approximately 1585, and that date is significant because 1580, as far as I've been able to learn, was the last Dutch Mennonite martyr. And so shortly after that began the Golden Age. And the reason you have martyrdom in, in the Netherlands so abruptly, you might say, when it didn't end in Switzerland, is because it was carried out, the martyrdom forces were the invading or occupying Spanish troops. There were not other Dutch people martyring Dutch Anabaptists, generally. They were under the thumb of, of Spanish rule. So when the Spanish left in 1580, essentially martyrdom ended, and a few years later, the Dutch realized that they had the, not only the freedom, but they had the responsibility of defining their own culture, building their own society. And Mennonites were deeply involved in that. In fact, one of the Mennonites who was most involved was Carl von Munder. I'd heard the name when I was a grad student at Berkeley, and people there were surprised that I had no idea who Carl von Munder was, because this Dutch uh, art historian said, well, he's a Mennonite, you should know him. And then later, Keith Sprunger said, you ought to study Carl von Munder. So, yes, in a way, he is responsible for me being here. Um, Carl von Munder is, how many of you have heard of him before I just mentioned his name? One, two, three, yeah, a few people have, yes indeed, good, very good. And I'm testing, or let's look at this, I have many slides so we're going to jump over a few. Mennonites were involved in these levels of the golden age. They held art dealerships, they're involved in painting, poetry, education, theater, benevolent societies, the first stock market, medicine, shipping and shipbuilding, and the whole idea of pluralism, religious pluralism in a society. Because Mennonites eventually were tolerated, it introduced the possibility that there could be many different expressions of Dutch Christianity, more than just Lutheran, more than just Catholic, and more than just the major party or group, the Dutch Reformed. So this minority group pushed, you might say, pushed the envelope so that society re respected or accepted the idea of pluralism. This then is Carl von Munder. And if you read Dutch, you could, this is a self-portrait, and so the words are his own. Ein nodig mensch, a notable person, might be how it's translated into English. And then on, on the bottom, so say many. This is not exactly Mennonite humility, <laughs> um, if you think that's well, how Mennonites are known. Now, maybe I'm mistranslating, and somebody can correct me on that. But that's essentially what my dictionary led me to think this meant. I did ask my son, who lived in Alkmaar for a year and is quite fluent in Dutch. He said, you're close enough. He would never say, you got it, but you're close enough. <laughs> Brief, but, well, let's leave the picture up. Van Mander was born near Antwerp to a fairly wealthy family, and he traveled from, he was gifted as a child with art and languages, 
even accents. He went to Rome at about the age of 20, 22, we assume, it's not exactly clear, and he studied painting in Rome. And he studied painting not with just anybody, but he studied with Giorgio, uh, Giorgio Vizieri, who was the assistant to Michelangelo in the painting of the Sistine Chapel. So we're talking about it, somebody studying with the great masters of the day, or if the word master is uh, problematic for you, one of the great names of the day. In Rome, he made a name for himself in a number of ways, and we can talk about that later. Um, but he stayed there about six years. Then when he returned to Antwerp, his brother wrote that he married a woman of his own faith. Now, what was that faith? Well, it's assumed it was Anabaptist or Mennonite. Because he had to leave Antwerp shortly after that, when the Catholic forces invaded his family home. And so he left, and he went to Harlem on the west coast of the, of the Netherlands, and there he started an art school, an art school that focused on painting, and he hired two other instructors. One of the instructors was Hendrik Glotzius, who was a Dutch Reformed painter, and the other one is Cornelius, Cornelius Sun, who whose own religious identity is a little murky because his parents, when he was just an infant, had to flee Harlem for safety. It's assumed they were a Mennonite or Anabaptist, or the Dutch, of course, don't use the word Mennonite. It's Dobbs Gazinda, but that's another story. And he was raised by a Catholic family for safety. But whether he was a, ever became a Catholic or remained a Mennonite, that is a bit unclear, you can read that he did both. The point I'm making is Carl von Mander's art school transcended religious boundaries. Very significant at that time, because when religious identity was central to your core, you had Lutheran schools, you had Catholic schools, you had Dutch reform schools, now suddenly you have a school that is, what, interreligious? This is quite, quite remarkable in every way. We talk about pluralism. This really underscores the idea of pluralism. The school itself did. Furthermore, we know that the school admitted students from all backgrounds, religious backgrounds, and they admitted women. One of the first educational institutions that admitted women at that time and we know that because Judas Lester, one of the famous painters of that time, went to school at the Harlem Academy. It was founded by Carl von Munder. So whether there are other women, we don't know. The records were not always kept. But of the well-known ones, we know that there were women who were students. Franz Halls studied at the Harlem Academy. And Franz Halls is a famous portrait painter. Well, Carl von Mander left Harlem to go to Amsterdam, we started another school, and this school is broader in its framework, painting, drawing, etching, but also what he called classics, as in Latin and Greek, and nature. He thought students need to study nature. Today we would use the word science, I suppose. What we have in his vision there is the beginning of what one might think as liberal arts. The fine arts, science, and history as a foundation for a liberal arts curriculum. This was Carl von Mander's vision in Amsterdam. This is then his first book, published in 1604, Het Schilderbuch, which is often translated as The Lives of the Painters of the Netherlands and North Germany, but it becomes the first book of the Golden Age about the arts. And it is still in print in Dutch, I'm told. It is one of the few books that's never gone out of print apart from the Bible or uh, the book of Quran, the Quran. Shakespeare went out of print for about a century. So he's got Shakespeare beat. 
Walter Mellian at Duke University uses that image in the cover of his book called The Netherlanders Canon, where he says, and this is where I get a lot of my ideas, just so you don't think I'm that creative. He says that Carl von Mander started the Golden Age, plain and simple. So we need to understand his book and his work. And therefore, he put that image on the cover of his book, The Netherlanders Canon. This is then a painting by Carl von Mander, and if you notice in art, usually you look first at where the white material is, the lightest material, your eye goes there, and you see that it is people standing in the foreground, just sort of milling around doing this. In the center is a fishmonger and somebody else selling things. There are a couple of dogs eating bones down below. But if you look up above, at the very top, you see something very different. He's painting the crucifixion. It's in the background. It's in the backdrop. And he's making, in my way of looking at it, a theological point. Namely, that in the lives of many people, the crucifixion is a shadow. It doesn't really exist. People don't live their lives, even at the base of the cross, impacted by the crucifixion. It's easy for them to ignore it, to carry on daily life, as though it's something that may have happened, but we're not going to pay attention to it. So he's making a theological point. Now this painting is in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, along with a number of other works. But the next one then shows his other point. This is Scipio, set in Rome. And Scipio, of course, was the general who defeated Hannibal when he attacked Rome with his elephants. So this shows his love for ancient history, the classics. And he had many paintings that emphasized the classics. Now, unfortunately, von Mander went out of style, and many of his paintings were painted over again. Many were destroyed. So they've only located about 19 of his paintings that are still in existence. I was lucky. One of them was in the Ann Arbor Art Gallery Museum. So I went and studied it quite often. It was the one where uh, Moses had led the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they're now with the Ark of the Covenant. This is then Cornelius Corneliuson, one of his colleagues at Harlem. And it shows the Jesus carrying the cross. And if you look carefully, all the people look rather Dutch. They don't look Middle Eastern at all. And that's really a significant point, because some would say this shows the cultural insensitivity of the time, and that might be a way to view it. But I want to also caution us too quickly on that interpretation, because about two decades ago, I attended a production of Hamlet at the Shakespeare Festival in Stratford, Ontario, and they had Hamlet and all of the others dressed in motorcycle outfits and leather jackets, with metal studs going up and down the arms and earlobes and all of that. And the critics said, wow, what a great updating of Hamlet. This makes the story more real. And I'm thinking, he's updating the story of the Bible and putting it in the Netherlands, making it more real to the people who are seeing it. Is that totally bad? So you're left with this conundrum. Where do you stand on that issue? Um, I would have preferred Hamlet done in traditional costume, of course, but on the other hand, it was kind of a, a delight to see it done in this kind of very modern motorcycle gang performance. This is Cornelius Cornelison in the painting that made him very famous, 1583. The, after the Spanish left, the local people had to organize their own, what we would call, police force. So this is the Harlem Civic Guards, the police force. And we don't have time to look at it, but I've studied this painting, which is also in the Rijksmuseum. And it looks like he used about three different people for his, for his uh, subjects. They all look alike with slight variations, except three of them look a little older, then three of them look a little middle-aged, and then the rest look quite young. So it's possible he just got three different people and painted their heads on top of the costumes and we're told 
that the ones in the center, he put them in the center because they paid him the most. <laughs> so to, to be center in the portrait, you have to cough up the gilder. This is then by Franz Halls, who was a student at Harlem, and I show this because it shows the Mennonite businessman, Lucas de Klerk, who was an importer of silks from Asia. And you can see by his outfit that it looks luxurious. So Franz Halls painted him in, the, in, his, in his best outfit, you might say. But the next painting is a really interesting one. And I, for one, will not pronounce that name. But this is then the clerk's wife. And one thing that Dutch couples did, or at least the painters did with Dutch couples, they usually painted the woman's name as the woman's name. The little parentheses underneath is found farther down in a book about this Parenti Steenkiste, which I'm mispronouncing totally, but women had their own identity in the Dutch Golden Age. Mennonite women have their own identity. My mother was in a play in our church back in Henderson, and the write-up of the play was, and this is A.A. Friesen played, and then they said the role that she played. It's like, wait a minute. She had a name. But I think you see the difference that I'm trying to make. It's just interesting. Well, women and families of that, that era often were painted separately from their men, but, they, but that didn't mean they often had their own name. But among Dutch Mennonites, they went by their own names. Dutch pluralism. I've talk, I haven't talked about the collegiate movement, but it was a movement that transcended the, also these religious denominations. So it had Dutch Reform, Mennonite, some Catholic, and some Jewish participants. There were academics, physicians, writers, artists, and even some pastors were involved. They held interfaith dialogues, and they gave lectures on various topics in many cities. They own boarding houses. Now, one theory is from my friend in Alkmaar is that the boarding house had originally been a convent, which, when the convents were emptied, were then taken over by the collegians to hold their meetings. Now, that may be true, may not be true. I've never found documentation on that, but that was his, the oral history, I suppose, of this Mennonite church in Alkmaar. They're deeply influenced by Jacob Arminius and Peter Balink. Now, Peter Balink is also being credited by Quakers as one of the early Quakers. So here's a man also who transcends religious denominations. And Mennonites were part of this. They were broader than just their own group at that time. This is then the regent of uh, the Rendsburg Collegiate House, a particular uh, etching of the time, showing a group of people. And what I find interesting about this particular etching is right here. There's an adult baptism going on. Catholics were not baptizing adults. Dutch Reform were not baptizing adults. So that leads you to conclude, how do you answer that sentence? See, Mennonites were meeting at the Dutch Collegiate House and baptizing new members there in the public fountain outside. So it's really interesting that Mennonites were that involved that somebody would even make an etching of that particular occasion. And if somebody can demonstrate that it, this is not a Mennonite group, I would definitely retract all I've said, but I have not found any other evidence. This is in Franz Hall's when he was at the uh, Harlem Academy, painted René Descartes. Now, how does, why does René Descartes end up in Rendsburg, in the Collegiate House? He ends up there because he was exiled from Paris. And where does he go? He goes to 
the collegian house in rendsburg and lives there and rene descartes of course is a what inventor of geometry was that analytic geometry i think i'm now talking way outside my field so and he also is a philosopher who who wrote i think therefore i am that name phrase is probably very familiar to you so i think therefore i am is is a quote that he's known by but i've often said i don't think he ever said don't put descartes before day horse <laughs> My students always love that. So. Cartesian coordinates. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and, it, and this is Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza was exiled from the Jewish community of Amsterdam, and he ends up living in the collegiate house in Rendsburg, where he's also painted, but probably by somebody from the French school. Now, Spinoza was an excellent lens maker. And so the best telescopes of the day were made by Spinoza. But he also wrote treatises on philosophy and ethics. And one of them was on the titled On the Existence of God. That's the English title. I cannot give you the Dutch title. And for that, he was ex exiled from Amsterdam by the Jewish community. And many accused him of atheism. So it's interesting that he ends up then living in the collegian house in Rendsburg, where I've just shown you Mennonites are gathering too. Not only does he live there in the collegian house, they publish his works. The reason we have Spinoza's works is because the collegians published his work. Philosophy, questioning how does one know God? It's really interesting that that level of conversation is going on, and we know, I'm quite sure, Mennonites were deeply involved in that. Well, Mennonite landscapes, another unique contribution that Mennonites made was the beginning of Dutch landscape painting, and they excelled in it. Now, they're not the only ones, but they excelled in it. And one who is often credited with beginning that movement was a Mennonite named Hercules Seeger. I thought of this and I thought, so you have a Dutch Mennonite family has a child and it's a boy. And the conversation is, what shall we name our blind son? And they say, Hercules. <laughs> I mean, this is just, to me, I just, I mean, I'm thinking of Henderson now. I, what if you grew up in Henderson and your name was Hercules? I mean, there just would be some questions asked about your parents, at least, if not at you. Or if they had a daughter, would she be Artemis? I, I don't know. And later, the Risedale family of painters expanded on this tradition, namely that three-fourths of the painting or more is the sky, and only one-fourth or the bottom part is the land. So it's a landscape, but the land is almost absent. Because what's active in the Dutch world is what's happening in the sky. That's what's alive. The land is kind of there, but the sky is alive. So we're going to show you the sky. So here's Hercules Seeger's painting of Harlem. And you really have to look hard to find Harlem. But you see the sky. It doesn't look that active, but you know there's something going on in the clouds and that it might rain any time, because it always rains in the Netherlands, so it's a safe prediction, but it might rain soon. Then you have Lambert Jacobson. I'm moving away from Harlem now to a city in Friesland, Leuwarden, Leeuwarden, and he was a Mennonite minister, a painter. He ran his own gallery. He was a teacher, and many find this interesting. Rembrandt studied with him for close to a year in Leuwarden, when Rembrandt was about 22, 23 years old. He was the father of the great 
painter Abraham Van Dien Temple. The last name is really not Jacobson, but Van Dien Temple. And he wrote treatises on, you should have art in the churches. Our churches should be adorned with paintings and stained glass windows. Really? I thought we were plain and simple people. That's the impression that we've been given, or I'm only speaking personally here, I've been given of what Mennonites were like. And here you have an artist pastor saying our churches should be filled with art. Now he paints, of course, fairly religious subjects. As a pastor, that would be make sense. A road to Emmaus, again, very Dutch-like in appearance. And you know the story of the road to Emmaus, I'm sure. But here's his son, Abraham Bending Temple, who moves among the nobility or the aristocratic classes of the Netherlands. Here he paints the family of the sister of William of Orange. William of Orange, of course, is well known also as King of England. So this is the level that Mennonite painters were working. Churches, schools, and among the nobility. Abraham Van Dien Temple also has this wonderful painting of 1622. And I love this. A Mennonite family, Abraham Van Dien Temple, no, I'm sorry, the David Lowe family. I misread that. And what you see the David Lowe family doing is a son is playing the cello, a woman in the center, is playing a keyboard instrument, probably a harpsichord or a piano. Another woman has music in her hands, top right, top to your right. And a younger girl has a newspaper in her hands, or at least something looks like a newspaper. Children were educated. Women were educated. And they had music as part of their daily life. Musical instruments were not banned. These are Mennonites who embraced aspects of culture and learning at that time. Abraham Van Dien Temple paints a Mennonite woman. Many assume it was his own mother. And uh, I have no idea yet how they make those collars and keep them looking that way, but that's another question. Then we come to the Uhlenberg family. Now, it's starting to sound like an encyclopedia, I know, but I'm trying to overwhelm you almost with names and dates and you don't have to remember any of them but other than the impression that there were a lot of them. The Uhlenbrug family, the Garrett, joined the Mennonites as a young man, we assume, in Leivarden, and he moved to Gdansk or Danzig then and later to Krakow in Poland. He was advisor to the Mennonites in the Vistula Valley, the Danzig area, and he became the furniture maker, painter, and decorator for King Sigismund III of Poland. His children grew up in the palace, essentially, in Poland, where their father was the decorator, the painter, and curator of exhibits. His brother, Rambertus, stayed in Louvarden. And it's not clear whether he was a Mennonite ever, but for the later in life, he definitely became Dutch Reformed. It's assumed that he was Mennonite and then became Dutch Reformed. He was a judge and mayor and the banker of Leuwarden. He was a founder of the university there. And his daughter, Saskia, married Rembrandt. So when Rembrandt goes to Leuwarden to study with Lambert Jacobson, he's encountering the Uhlenberg family, and he meets their daughter, and they marry later. Henrik Uhlenberg, then the son of Garrett, the man who went to Krakow, he went back to Amsterdam, or he went to Amsterdam, where he founded the largest art gallery in the Netherlands at the time. And that art gallery flourished for nearly two centuries. What he did is he lived on he lived on the second floor with his family of this four-story building. The first floor was a gallery. 
The third floor consisted of his own studio, and the fourth floor, he had students living there. The partitioned, uh, one big room partitioned up so students could live there and work. You had your own little cubicle with a bedroll and your easel and paints, whatever you wanted to do. Rembrandt lived in one of those cubicles for six years before he married then Saskia Uhlenburg. And he worked for Hendrik Uhlenburg. Now, Hendrik Uhlenburg was a Mennonite. He was a deacon of the Mennonite church. He was very active. And he developed a system, what we would call today on the futures market, for art. People would come, put down their money, and the painter would paint. And when the painting was finished, the painter would be paid. In the meantime, the gallery has the money. <laughs> That's not a bad system. There's a big, heavy book that explains it all, and I'm not sure I'm following it, and I'm summing it up in three sentences. This, then, is Henry Gulenberg's wife, painted by Rembrandt, in appreciation for all their kindness. This is then Saskia. Uhlenberg, Rembrandt's wife. He did many portraits of her, etchings and drawings. So Skia, of course, as you probably know, had difficulty with the childbirth and uh, at the age of 26 died within months after Titus, young Titus, was born. And in her will, she left her money to the young Titus to be administered by her uncle, Hendrik Uhlenburg. And that Titus should pay Rembrandt an annual stipend. She, I think, had some idea that Rembrandt's fingers were very slippery when it came to money. And she thought her uncle would be a better manager of funds. And that system worked until Titus married and died. Then his wife got all the money and kicked Rembrandt out of his own house. And he was destitute for many years. Well, this is the road to Emmaus by Rembrandt. You can see, very different from the one we saw earlier. I think it's quite different. And the one reason is that Rembrandt used a Jewish young man from the neighborhood as the model for Jesus. He puts Jesus in the Middle East, in the Jewish community. He does not paint, he does not paint Jesus as a Dutchman. He paints him as a Jew. This is the Jacobson painting and the Rembrandt one. And immediately when you have that information, you can see that not only is Rembrandt painting a great painting, he is changing religious interpretation. To locate Jesus as a Jew is very different than locating him in a church in the Netherlands. I like this painting a lot. I, I probably dwell on it too much, but Rembrandt painted the Jewish bride, a neighbor of his. And the reason I like it is the frame you see is also part of the painting because she has her hands reaching out of, out of and onto the frame. It's like, I'm trying to get out of here. Let me get out of here. I want to get out of this world I'm in. I want to go somewhere new. This, this frame I'm in is confining to me. You can have your own interpretation, but I think it's funny. Beautiful woman, the Jewish bride, painted by Rembrandt. Then we come to Gerrit Uhlenbrug, the son of Hendrik, who managed the Uhlenbrug studios after his father's death. He was also a collector, painter, and dealer. And he supervised, continued to supervise the collection of the King of Poland, now King Casimir, fairly well-known king. Furthermore, he was the one who collected what's called the Dutch gift 28 paintings, 12 sculptures for Charles II, who became King of England after the Restoration. Most of those are still in the royal collection. 
one many of them are hung now in the chapel at windsor castle and i don't know if you remember but about twenty years ago prince andrew had a big party there and had a big fire and some of these paintings were destroyed but some most of them survived but if you go to windsor chap castle today and go to the chapel you still see paintings from the dutch collection organized by the mennonite painter Gerrit Ullenburg. Then Abraham, another son, went to Ireland. He collected paintings for the Duke of Ormond. That is now the National Gallery of Ireland. So you can see that not only were Mennonites well established in the Netherlands, they became quite well known in England and Ireland also. This ended Jacob Becker, a self-portrait, a student of Rembrandt. And this is Jacob Becker's painting of the Amsterdam Guard, 1642, when they were the police force. And again, it's assumed that the guys in the middle paid the most money. And some guy way up here must have been almost penniless. <laughs> so... You barely even see his face. But here we see distinct people. He's not using the two or three models to paint all the people. The same configuration of people was painted by another Mennonite, Govert Flink, the same year because they had a competition to see who could paint the best painting of the Civic Guard. And so this is the same, these are the same people as you see here, but slightly different configuration. And Govert Flink adds the orange flag for the House of Orange, which is, of course, the royal family of the Netherlands. But then we come to the painting you probably know. You probably have never seen these. The painting you probably know is this one. Same year, painted by Rembrandt. The same civic guards. If you study these paintings like I did at the Rijksmuseum about three years ago, you can see they're wearing the same clothes, essentially. Now you have the key people walking somewhere. They're going to their right. You have a man up higher pointing to the, to the right as though there's some commotion over there that somebody has to pay attention to. There's a guy loading his musket here. Well, that doesn't always work. The drummer is beating a drum to get the march going. But in the middle of this, you see something the other painters did not do. Rembrandt paints his wife, Saskia, in the middle of the painting. But it isn't a celebrative portrait. She looks terrified. The women understand war also, and the horrors of it. There's one interpretation one can give to this. Or was he just interested in painting Saskia? If he was just interested in painting Saskia, he probably would have painted her in a noble way. But if you study that painting up close, like I have now more than once, she's terrified. So what's going to happen to these men as they go to danger for the city guard? Now at one point, the painting was too large for the area they, where they wanted to hang it. And so they cut off about a foot and a half off of each end, and about a foot off the top. And so what's left today is this. And the lesson you can draw from that is if you buy a Rembrandt, it doesn't fit your wall. You just cut it down the size and see whether it fits better then. So apparently that's acceptable behavior when it comes to a Rembrandt. I'm joking. I included this image without realizing it's hanging on the wall over there too. Uh, the Mennonite Orphanage in Amsterdam. Mennonite Orphanage for Women. And the doorway, I'm told, is here and encompassed much of this building over here. Fairly large setup. But what I find most interesting is these are the regions of the Mennonite Orphanage in Amsterdam. Women's Orphanage, and you'll notice 
They can run an orphanage without having a man overlook their work. <laughs> They're women running the orphanage. They're capable of doing this. Women are in charge. They know how to run an establishment. Again, this goes against what many might assume happened in earlier generations where women were only shunted into the back rooms and never really were in public very much. Here's evidence right here that at least among Mennonites of that time, women were very, very active in the social fabric of the city and of their life. And to back that up, Anita, Agnita Block, who was a botanist, patron, illustrator, paper artist, sometimes called the Dutch Audubon, is shown here at work. And at her feet, you see a very thick book. What she would do is she would paint plants, make one copy, and sell, put it in a book and sell that copy to someone for huge sums of money. She made, they think, over a thousand of them. No one knows for sure, because no one has ever located any in the last 200 years. They might be in private collections, but no one even knows whether they exist. Now, Agnita Block was a Mennonite from Emmerich, which is near the German border, but very Dutch. And when she died, and her husband died, they donated their estate to the Dutch government for the study of nature. This Carl von Munder idea, the study of nature, which she then perfected with her art. Today, that estate and that building is the Institute of Ecology for the Dutch government. They have been studying ecology since 1600. Joachim Oden was an educator at the University of Leiden. In theology, he emphasized the life of Jesus is more important than the doctrines around Jesus. He was an organizer with the collegians and befriended Spinoza. Well, we can go on in that, but then we come to Rembrandt, and the questions around Rembrandt are many. First of all, his family was Dutch Reformed, but he was a very gifted child and he went to the University of Leiden to study Latin, and the goal was to study law. But he dropped out in order to study painting. He moved to Amsterdam where he first studied with Peter Lastman at the age of 18, and then went to Henrik Uhlenberg's studio home, and a year in Rombertus Uhlenberg's gallery with Jacob Lam Lambertson as a student, as an instructor. He married Saskia, I mentioned that, and by all accounts, their marriage was a happy one. Now the question becomes, was Rembrandt a Mennonite? And here we have a Mennonite student who at the age of 15, comes from a rural area of the Netherlands to study painting with the great Rembrandt. And he would write this, in January 1642, I entered Rembrandt's studio, and he, Rembrandt, was demonstrably a Mennonite. It was at this very time, following Saskia's death, that Rembrandt's growing religious perceptivity was evident. What did this 15-year-old see when he entered Rembrandt's studio that made him conclude immediately that Rembrandt is a Mennonite? The answer is, he never tells us. We have no idea. At least I haven't found it. And I've tried to wade through his book. But what we have in, in uh, Hoekstraten, an introduction to the Academy of Painting. This is now the second book on Dutch art written by a Mennonite. The first one, Carl van Mander. And now, half a century later, another one by Mennonite. He became eventually the director of the Dutch Mint, meaning this man was highly respected. Dutch Mint does not mean mints, as in chocolates, it meant he made the money. 
He supervised the making of money for the king. Well, was Rembrandt a Mennonite? Well, another source says that a student from, from uh, uh, Denmark, Bernard Keo, said that, yes, he was a member of the Mennonites, meaning Mennonite. Does that prove it? I don't know. Then we have Otto ben Benesch, a recent biographer, well, not that recent, 1923, the German edition. Rembrandt's connection with the Jewish world was very deep and intimate one. He himself, according to an old account, belonged to the Mennonite sect, whose origins go back to the Anabaptist movement of the early 1600s. There's one of the biggest biographies of Rembrandt ever claiming Rembrandt was a member of the Mennonites. That was followed shortly thereafter by Carl Norman. Rembrandt belonged to the liberal wing of the Mennonite community of Amsterdam, namely the Waterlander Mennonite Church. Or Jacob Rosenberg, the Harvard professor, who wrote in the 1960s, documentary evidence for his adherence to the Mennonite creed is fairly positive. And what really counts is his spiritual affinity with Mennonites. Jacob Rosenberg, I never met him, but I've talked to people who studied with him, said he was adamant that Rembrandt should be viewed as belonging to the Mennonites of Amsterdam, especially the Waterlander Mennonite Church. Well, who says no to that? Well, there, I don't need to go into that. You can ask it later. Rembrandt's Mennonite years, Gary... Schwartz, a recent, another recent biographer, says, for 40 years Rembrandt interacted deeply with the Mennonites of Amsterdam. In fact, when Saskia died, when Titus died and he had no money, he went and lived with the pastor of the Waterlander Mennonite Church who rescued him from poverty. The Mennonite Encyclopedia in any case, Rembrandt's religion was in its deepest essence Mennonite, formed by Mennonite influences, and his essential spirit and expression were Mennonite in character. Rembrandt was the obvious product of a Mennonite environment. That's the Mennonite Encyclopedia making a statement. Or, of course, Nani van der Zip saying it, but he's a Dutch scholar of high regard. So when he was living with Cornelius Onslow, the Mennonite minister of Waterlander Mennonite Church, he decided to give him a thank you gift. This is what the story is. And so he made this etching of Cornelius Onslow. But a member of that church, a playwright by the name of Joost van den Vondel, also a Mennonite, objected to this particular etching and said, I, Rembrandt, Paint Cornelius's voice. His visible part is the least choice. The invisible is known only through the ear. Whoever wants to see Onslow must hear. In other words, your etching is kind of dead in the water. Forget it. You put it in modern language. Fondo was a deacon of the Waterlander Mennonite Church where Cornelius Onslow was the pastor. So this is what Onslow did. This is what Rembrandt did next. He paints Onslow in his study with his books, and next to him a woman, a woman who is looking away from him, and it's a thought of as somewhat of a advice session. We don't quite know what they were talking about. Nobody ever recorded it. And about 150 years after the painting was done, somebody wrote on the back, Cornelius Onslow and his wife. So ever since then, it's been called Cornelius Onslow and his wife. But if you go to the Berlin Gallery, the Staatsgallery in Berlin, and study this painting, doubts begin to arise. Cornelius Onslow would have been 35 at the time of the painting, and his wife would have been 28. She does not look 28 in the painting. In fact, I would say it cannot be his wife. The only 
scholar I've read who agrees with me is a guy named called Bob Hock, who was the director of the Reichs Museum for about 30 years. He agrees that it cannot be his wife. But others say, yeah, except the story, it was his wife. Rembrandt paints two Africans. Now, what I find interesting about this, and my students always found interesting, was they looked like Africans. If you look at earlier paintings in the Middle Ages of African people, they're often just black, dark black faces with white eyes, part of the eye white, and sometimes smiling with white teeth. They're caricatures of black people. Rembrandt seems to be able to paint them as real people. So if you saw the painting and then saw these guys on the street, you would recognize them as having been the people posing for the painting. He actually poses actual people who are African to paint them. Rembrandt with a half-open door, woman in half-open door, very famous painting. Many of his students had to repaint this painting, so there are many examples, but they're all of his by his students. Then Rembrandt paints Dr. Tolp doing an anatomy lesson. This is so significant on a number of levels. One is that the guy standing up on high has been identified as a Mennonite student. But what's most important is the Netherlands was the only country in, the, in the Europe at that time where you could do actual dissections of cadavers in a medical school. All the others had to rely upon other life forms like pigs and frogs. But because they did actual dissections of cadavers, Dutch doctors had an advantage over other educated doctors in Europe at that time. And that made them in high demand everywhere. Dr. Top, of course, was Dutch Reformed. His wife was a member of the Waterlander Mennonite Church. And somehow they made it work. Then Rembrandt paints the Draper's Guild. The men, and these are men, yes, who are responsible for inspecting every single bolt of cloth that arrives from Europe to make sure that it has integrity. And they were wealthy people who then donated money to charity. The shipbuilder, one of the great shipbuilders of that time was a Mennonite named Jan Reichsen. And again, his wife goes by her name, Gret Jen. It isn't Jan Reichsen and his wife, Mrs. Reichsen, but it's her name. They worked together. But he was one of the most famous shipbuilders of the time. And by now you probably know we're talking about the Dutch East India Company. We're not talking about making little boats, rowboats for the rivers, canals. We're talking about making massive ships. Rembrandt paints his neighbor, Rabbi Manasseh ben Israel, a man who wrote commentaries on the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, paints him as he is. And he paints his son as Jesus, the son of the, of the rabbi. That image is still in use today, far and wide. Why, look at this. A recent publication of Dostoevsky's The Idiot uses that same painting on the cover. Rembrandt paints his daughter Cornelia, and he paints his son Titus. This is a few months before Titus died. When he's also poor, the Mennonite Apothecary Abram Franzen would come to his house, we're told quite frequently, and say, Show me your debts. And Rembrandt would give him the pile of debts, and then Franzen would take a painting and say, I'll take this painting, and here's the money to pay off your debts. Not all artists can work that way, but he did. Govert Flank, a Mennonite student of Rembrandt, did a self-portrait. Flink does a woman in pearl. Flink paints a Turk, somebody from Turkey, who looks like they're from Turkey. And Flink also paints a, an archer, an African. 
living in Amsterdam, but who he wanted him to look like an archer. But then we come to Hoogstraten, the name I mentioned earlier, who became the director of the Dutch Mint. Hoogstraten saw portrait. Hoogstraten shadow dancers, a theater design from 1672. And I taught lighting design. I had no idea what lighting instrument they could have used to make that kind of shadows on the wall at that time. There's no electricity. They're dependent on candles and tallow for light. What in the world gave him the idea that you could throw a light to make those shadows in 1672? This is long before carbon arc lamps were designed, long before gas lamps were designed. I, to this day, cannot figure this out, but maybe somebody knows and uh, can give me a footnote. Folks rotten at home. Then we come to one of the important theologians of the time, Hans de Ries. Hans de Ries witnessed some of the last martyrs, and he then left his monastery. He had been a monk, and at first he joined a Dutch Reformed church as a pastor, but he quit after six months because he said after sermon after sermon, they talked about the dangers of bringing your swords to church. They persisted in continuing to do so, so I left. And he left and he went to Altmar, where he joined the Mennonites, or the Anabaptists of that time. And he became a very significant leader among the Anabaptists of Altmar. Um, Hans de Ries organized what he called disputations or dialogues with the English Baptists, who came in large numbers to the Netherlands to engage in studies and mutual agreements. The goal was to unite these small Protestant groups. He also, believe it or not, organized conferences with the Polish Socians. Polish Socians are today called the early Unitarians. But Hans de Ries organized those conferences to try and see whether dialogue is possible, and unity was possible. And then he wrote after one of those conferences, he thought unity could never work because they just don't understand the Incarnation. <laughs> so, oh well. He's the one who started the Dutch Benevolent Society, as far as I know. The Dutch Benevolent Society is organized in 1612 to aid Swiss Mennonites who were under persecution. They aided them in two ways. One is to leave Switzerland and to come to the Netherlands. But those who are unhappy in the Netherlands, to help them to go to America. A lot of the early Swiss Mennonites who came to America came because of the help from the Dutch Mennonite Benevolent Society that was started by Hans de Ries in 1612. And by the way, he wrote over a thousand pages of theological studies, at least I don't I can't find any that are translated into English. It's an oversight in our, maybe, in our history, but then you have to find somebody competent in Dutch to translate. This is in a book, recent book, Dutch Aid Documents, the Dutch Benevolent Society documents written back and forth between Switzerland and the Netherlands to aid the Swiss Mennonites who are trying to leave Switzerland because of continued persecution. This is about a 700 page book, bilingual. Now one side is German and Dutch, the other side translated into English. And you might be surprised, it was published by the Ohio Amish Library. Then we come to the Risedales. They were also landscape painters. The three of them were best known, Solomon, his brother Isaac, and then Jacob, the son of Isaac. Of course, Jacob is always the son of Isaac, right? But that's another. Initially, they worked in the Harlem Academy, and then they became independently wealthy and famous. This is now Harlem in the bleaching fields by one of the Risedales. You'll notice again the sky, the sky, the sky. Oh, yes, there's Harlem, but oh, you see the church and two churches, and down in front are the bleaching fields because the Netherlands is known for flax and to make flax uh, uh, into cloth, white cloth, you had to bleach it. Jean de Bray, a Mennonite publisher, 
Um, the Mennonite painter who painted Abraham Vincent Castellan and his wife Margrethe von Brocken. Again, woman has her own name. She is not known as Mrs. Castellan. They published books for the collegians, including Spinoza, and funded by the collegians. And when he died somewhat young, his wife for 20 years, or close to 20 years, ran the publishing company and did it well. So women were involved in business. John de Bray in Mennonite paints the Harlem Regents, who were orphanage directors, the blonde man in the center with a pen, and I'm told is a Mennonite, as well as the man standing with his hat off. Now, why is his hat off? People have wondered about that. But David Molem and his family were Mennonites, painted in a Roman ruin. He was a wealthy silk importer. Then we come to this. Mennonite ships. Mennonite ships carrying the flag of the East India Company. The Mennonites were limited to the Baltic Sea with their ships because they would not carry cannon on their ships. And the Baltic Sea was seen as safe harbor. Those who carried cannon went on the open sea all the way to India and the Far East. But those were not, I'm told, or I've read, not the Mennonite ships. So people talk about, how do you carry out pacifism when you're so involved in the, in the real world and not withdrawn in little communities? Here's an example. The Mennonite ships would not carry cannon, we're told. Now there is one example of a Mennonite, published a Mennonite Quarter Review about two decades ago, who went on one of those ships to Asia where they had cannon and he died there of an illness. So God's judgment visited him, I guess you might say, in a good Mennonite way of looking at things. These are Mennonite whaling ships. Now that makes some people wince, I understand that. But remember, whaling was a business. Whales are thought of as plentiful. And whale oil was, a needed, was needed for lamps and other things. They had not known yet how to make crude oil into kerosene, gasoline, and all these other things. Whale oil was a staple in many ways. Jan van Goyen, Mennonite painter of landscapes, again, the sky, the sky, the sky, but he adds a little more in the foreground. Abraham van, Jan van Goyen, or I said Abraham, the sea near Harlem, well, you can really barely see Harlem, but you see the two big life forces that are ever changing, the sea and the sky. They're interested in what is changing in the world, not what is stable and well built and established. How are we adapting to change? Think about the sea. Think about the sky. It is always present and ever-changing. Now, I like this painting. It's a bit esoteric. But Jan van Goyen paints himself seated on the chair in the center. I don't know. This thing is not working. But you see the red chair in the center. That's his self-portrait. The man there, we don't know who he is. But then his daughters, to your right, one is at a keyboard, the other one has a lute. They're musicians. There are animals in front. There's a daughter in the middle, reading a book, educated. There's a man leaning over to her. This, Van Goyen tells us, is when the painter, Jan Steen, I pronounce it, American pronunciation, I understand. Jan Steen visited their house and proposed marriage to his oldest daughter. How many of you proposed marriage in front of her whole family? That's just a... Arnold Hobrocken, another Mennonite, then wrote the final book on the Dutch Golden Age, 
so you have three big books defining and describing the dutch golden age all written by mennonites no other books at that time were comparable in quality or content mennonites defined the golden age they didn't just live through it they defined it here's the three volume set i haven't found a translation and my dutch is so slow that beyond the first few pages i give up Mennonite architects, we probably have heard of the Block family, again, American pronunciation. William the father and then the two sons who went to Danzig or Gdansk today, where they designed this street. Have you been to Gdansk ever? Danzig? You've seen this street, very famous. Destroyed in World War II, but rebuilt. Designed by Mennonites from Amsterdam. That's why it looked so Dutch, of course. And an artist at that time growing up in Amsterdam, growing up in Danzig was Enoch Zeeman. I'm sorry, I'm really running long. I, I'm, I'm long-winded. If some of you need to leave, it's okay. Uh, Enoch Zeeman went to England where he made his fame. He painted King George, the coronation portrait. He painted Sir Isaac Newton, the official portrait, which hangs in the Library at Cambridge University. He painted the first Lord Churchill, the Duke of Marlborough, who would be Winston Churchill's ancestor. We're talking about Mennonite painters being in the center of where things happen. You know the, you know this, you know the line from the play. I want to be in the room where it happens, right? Hamilton. Mennonites were in the room where it happened. They were there. Then we come to Johannes Decknow quite well known in this room in particular. Johannes Denknadel started the Mennonite Seminary in 1735 in Amsterdam, and he invited many theologians from across Europe to come to his house and share dialogues, including Count Zinzendorf, the founder of the Pietists, and including John Wesley, who stayed with them for six months, we're told, where they discussed the theology and music in the church. And Johannes Denknow was a proficient organist himself. And there's his organ. If you look to your left, you see it in person. But that's his pipe organ, which I'm told still works today. The Amsterdam stock market, if you're interested in business. Here's a portrait or an etching that is really quite revealing. The businessmen in Amsterdam were all Dutch, reformed, oh, sorry. but the traders, the one who did the bidding, shouting their bids on the trading floor, it's called, were all Mennonites. Why were they all Mennonites? Because their word was, their nay is nay, their yea is yea. They could be trusted with oral transactions and a handshake. And to this day, if you go to a board of trade, the people standing on the floor of the board of trade are shouting their orders up to their associates on a higher level. Mennonites, their trustworthiness established that as a business model that still is in existence today. If you ever have any money in the stock market, this is what you need to think about as to how your money is being used. Another etching, this is so famous, many artists rendered this scene over and over again. Then we come to Jan Leuken, now the name of the fine arts building, which on this campus, he wrote over 20,000 poems, many were hymns, and he made 3,251 etchings. I think 300 of them appear in the Martyr's Mirror. I'm not sure exactly the number, that might be wrong. But he was the man who did those works. Uh, the Dutch Aid Society, I've talked about that already. Hospital orphanages. Then we come to Gobert Lidno, Bidlow, who wrote the book on surgery. I talked about dissecting cadavers as a way to learn surgery. He's the one who then wrote the book. Used 
translated into many European languages, that's the standard that was used for studying surgery at that time. His nephew, Nicholas Bidlou, happened to be lucky enough when Peter the Great got injured in Amsterdam, the Tsar of Russia, Nicholas Bidlou, Bidlou was the doctor, treated his leg, healed him, and so when Peter the Great went back to Moscow, he brought Nicholas Bidlou with him to start a school of medicine. That school of medicine still exists today in Moscow, started by Nicholas Bidlou, who also was a composer and an architect and a, a general all-around gifted person. He wrote the first book in Russian on medicine. Think about that. The very first book on Russia, in Russian on medicine. He was so famous that an Italian playwright, Carlo Galdoni, spoofed him in a comic called The Dutch Doctor, spoofing Nicholas Bidlou and his approach. But if you go to Moscow, you go to the medical school, this is what you see. Peter the Great at six foot eight, standing beside Nicholas Bidlou, the Mennonite who started the medical school in Moscow. Then we come to Josefany Fondo. This will be my last figure. If you're looking at your watch, I'm sorry. I should have warned everybody I'm a bit long with you. I come from the Windy City. It makes sense. But Josefany Fondo was Mennonite until he was about 54. His wife died after a long illness, and his son disappeared at sea. He fell into what we would call today, but was not viewed that way then. He fell into melancholy or depression. And he withdrew as a deacon from the Waterlander Mennonite Church and possibly joined a small, what we might call today, house church run by a Catholic priest. He wrote many plays, large number of poems. He's often called the Shakespeare of Holland. Not because his plays are at the level of Shakespeare's level, we might say, but because he took a language like Shakespeare had taken English, viewed as a gutter language of Europe, and he made it beautiful. And after Shakespeare, everybody thought English was beautiful. Before Shakespeare, everything you read about English is, it's really a gutter language, it's ugly. And Jos van den Fondo did the same thing with Dutch. After, after him, Dutch writers loved to write beautiful Dutch poetry and plays. Before that, they also viewed it as a gutter language. His famous play is called Giesbrecht von Amstel, written while he was still a Mennonite. And uh, it was commissioned by the city of Amsterdam to be the first play in the new theater. The new theater would open at Schoberg, 1635. But once the city council read the play, they, no, 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 we cannot do this play in our theater. This cannot be done. So they withheld approval for the play, but Jos van den Fondo refused to write another one, and the theater board refused to commission another play. And so finally, two years later, 1635, the play opened, and it continued in performance every year in Amsterdam until 1968 except for 1941 to 44, the Nazi occupation years. So Jos van den Fondel play Giesbrecht is the longest running play in Western history, written as a Mennonite. Now some say that his early plays, eight, written as a Mennonite, show his weakness in Mennonite doctrine and therefore Catholic leanings. But after he left the Mennonites, Catholics say, wait a minute, his later plays show a secret Mennonite bias. So he's been sort of rejected by both camps as one of theirs, you might say. This is then the opening of the Schoberg Theater of Giesbrecht, um, 1637. You can see it's not just a little play done in sort of somebody's garage. This is then a recent portrait of the cast, 1957. 
The statue of Fondo in Fondo Park in Amsterdam, if you've been to Amsterdam, you know Fondo Park. And why we study this history, I found Ernest Palm, who I do not know personally, but their history may hold much of interest and relevance to North American Mennonites in the 20th century. We have, in a way, gone through some of the same challenges of the Dutch Mennonites in the Golden Age, adapting to our culture, engaging with our culture, while trying to hold on to our values and our belief systems. The Dutch were doing that. In one sense, they become a model for us as how to do it effectively. Then I found this quote by Mary Sprunger, who has some family connections here. But one of the enduring questions in Dutch Anabaptist Mennonite history has been, why and how did the Mennonites get rich? Because it's so obvious they got rich. And she writes that research has uncovered a surprising number of people seeking baptism who were already well-established members of Amsterdam elite. Those individuals who became Mennonite in the early years of the Dutch Republic, namely after 1580, brought, with, brought their capital along and with their souls into the Mennonite fold. So she says, you got Mennonite? So it's a very good question. How the rich got Mennonite, rather than how the Mennonites got rich. <laughs> kind of a nice turn of phrase, which I like. Well, any questions, comments, rebuttals? I, this is a hobby of mine. It, I, it was not my professional career to teach Dutch Mennonite history. But it's a hobby of mine, and I've tried to take it seriously. And if your questions prove or demonstrate I've overlooked things, I definitely will reconsider what I've said to you. Any questions? Yes? Well, I have a thought, which is, in many ways, Bethel College continues in the tradition of the collegiate. Uh, Bethel College continues in the tradition of the collegiate and of the Dutch Mennonites, because so many of the people founded Buffalo, uh, Buffalo, I'm sorry. A Bethel College, that's another part of my, my whatever. But the, the founders of Bethel College came out of that tradition all the way going back to Amsterdam. And so I think many people in this room probably have roots that go all the way back to Friesland and Amsterdam. Uh, unlike, for example, the Mennonites who were much poorer and much more oppressed along the Rhine River uh, and the ones who had to be helped later. So I, I think that's a reason for those of us who are involved with Bethel to uh, a little hubris, at least, if not just plain old pride <laughs> right. for, for our background. Well, and I should point out the reason why no oral traditions in, that I know of in our Dutch sort of Russian Mennonite American history go back to Amsterdam is because our ancestors, the Dutch ones, left in 1550 or so, 1555, so 30 years before the Golden Age began. So we were not there. We, during, we were not there during the Golden Age. Some may have traveled back and forth, but we were already in Danzig. We already were in Gdansk by the time Karl von Lunder starts his art school. My so ancestors... much for my comment. <laughs> <laughs> but, no, in spirit, you're in right. Spirit, yeah. in, so I was going to say, in spirit, you're exactly right. That vision was reincorporated here, probably by people who then studied that history, but not due to oral tradition. Okay. Anyway, that's, all I'm, that's the distinction I'm making. Yeah, the, well, I would side with, with, with you. The, up until the receipt of the Spanish Armada yep. uh, and the, the departure of the Spanish, almost all of Flat Mennonites in Flanders fled. Yep. They fled north and they yep. fled east. And so there were all these craftsmen and artisans yep. and writers and so forth who were forced to become farmers in the Vistula yep. Delta. Yep. And yep. that, those are the ones who went to Russia. Right, you're right. Yeah. That's how I understand it too. Yeah. And there may be documents proving otherwise, but I haven't run into them. I mean, I'm, so, yes. Uh, Lauren, I, uh, I appreciate what you've done here. I think it's really very good. And um, I was just going to mention that uh, in some circles, Dutch Mennonites are viewed as a kind of decline of the faith. People go to Amsterdam, they say, well, I went to the church and there were only 20 people there. Yeah. What kind of a church is that? Yeah. But you have emphasized many of the contributions that yeah. Dutch made. But they, they're still
strength of that in membership on Sunday morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I really... This may not be right on topic, but I would like to add. I watched the series by uh, a Dr. McDermott from Oxford. And part of it covered why the church declined in Europe after World War II in attendance. So if you go to a Lutheran church in Hamburg, where I was a few years ago, that could seat normally the St. Michael's Church, that could seat maybe 1,500 people, there are a few chairs in front in a circle with maybe 20 at the most. And I went to a, cup, a mass at the Cone, Great Cone Cathedral, and at that Mass on Sunday morning, there were probably five people present. And McDermott's thesis is that after World War II, we see the effect of the destruction of Christianity as a system of belief. Started by Hitler, of course, and maybe some of the misquoted philosophers he relied upon, such as Nietzsche, and the public became disenchanted with the hope that the church could provide. And so they just walked out. Uniformly, not just Mennonites, but uniformly walked out. And I think in, in England it's almost the same. It, it was in 1905 when George Bernard Shaw, the British playwright, said that in his day, 1905, the churches of England were packed and the theaters were empty. But he predicted in a century the churches would be empty and the theaters would be packed. What do we do with quotes like that when they're so accurate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Just to the latter, uh, in Germany, the museums are packed on a Sunday and not the churches. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but uh, museums' uh, experiences can also be like church. Yeah. Uh, it, but um, I was just curious. Uh, the two books that I read by Simon Sharma. Yes, Simon Sharma. Go ahead. So I wonder, did you yeah. mention, the, I missed it. I did mention his name, but Rembrandt's eyes is very important, and then and the he, embarrassment of riches. Right. So I, I, I learned a lot from both of them. They were fantastic. I just, I, there are so many readings I did that I didn't yeah. have time to mention. But yes, yeah, so Simon Sharma is fantastic. I don't know how you pronounce his name correctly, so but I, I do Sharma. S-E-H-A-M-A. And I pronounce it uh, in German, <laughs> yeah. and that's why I both wrong. Yeah. But, yeah. But, and also, I just want to say thank you very much for, for the enormous amount of material you, you gave us. Uh, and I was touched because one of the authors uh, that you quoted on the question whether Rembrandt might be considered Mennonite yeah. was uh, Mr. Rotermund, yep. who was a good friend of my dad. Ah. They oh, I, I would not have known together. that. <laughs> so, no, it was a I would not have known that. Yeah. And I should add, too, that I, I've done a lot of research in the city of Göttingen in Germany. I've done it on the, this sort of quasi-Mennonite playwright, Hermann Sudermann, and they have a lot of his collections. And there the church, Johanneskirche, Sunday morning has 20 people, like we would have, but on Friday night, jazz night, it's packed. And on Saturday night, during the open mic poetry reading, it's packed. And so the priest says, our church is great. The arts are bringing back the life and spirit of the church. That the service on Sunday somehow doesn't connect in the same way. But our arts life does. And so he is, this particular uh, Lutheran, it's a Lutheran church, not Mennonite, was very adamant in defending that the church is not losing people. We're just changing formats. But it's still worship in his eyes. I leave that as a thought. Any other questions? Not exactly a question, but uh, I think before we close that uh, you should have included who uh, who wrote the 75th anniversary play of Bethel's <laughs> anniversary. <laughs> that would be? Lauren. That would be a, a guy named Lauren. <laughs> Well, I was invited to do it, and I was honored to do it, and uh, and it's actually mentioned in the book that Keith Sprunger wrote, which is more than one really probably deserves in life, but it was really a great experience. Have you written some other drama? Yes, I wrote the uh, Goshen College Centennial play, 
And I wrote a play that was published years ago by Samuel French on King David, uh, the biblical character. Uh, they dropped publication when there weren't enough productions, which is what they do uh, typically. And uh, I've written a few other small ones. I've written, uh, yeah, I've written a few. And and I I have experiences like the Greek playwrights did. They often the Greek playwrights often had their plays done during one day festival, and after that they were forgotten. So I understand that very well. <laughs> Well, thank you all for coming. I'm sure Lauren would be willing to stick around and entertain yeah. more questions. So we appreciate very much uh, that you were able to come, Lauren, and give a fascinating talk. So and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Yeah.